Welcome everyone to 7.8, Improper Integrals. Now, unlike the other sections, I actually want to start with an example. And the example is going to motivate what are improper integrals and why do we need this theory. Okay, so let's get to it with just evaluating out this integral and the integrals of 1 over x squared uh, from negative 1 to 1. And if we were doing this just like any old integral, well, we'd find the antiderivative, negative 1 over x, and then evaluate that uh, at negative 1 and at 1, and, you know, subtract the difference. Okay, so in this case, that would be negative 1 over 1 minus, right, subtract, negative 1 over negative 1. Okay, we see a little bit of cancellation happens here, and we get negative 1 minus 1, and that would give us negative 2. And this should set off some bells. <laughs> so the answer should not be negative 2. And the reason why is, well, let's take a look at the graph, right? The definite integral is supposed to tell us the area under the curve uh, from negative 1 to 1. So here is our curve. And remember, uh, this area is counted positively if the graph is above the x-axis, and it's negative if it's below the x-axis. So this graph is above the x-axis here, and if I shade in this area, it looks positive, right? It shouldn't be negative, let alone why would it be negative 2? So the issue here is the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're relying on the fundamental theorem of calculus to calculate out our integral here, uh, but the fundamental theorem says that we need our function to be continuous, and our function is not continuous, and therefore this doesn't work. So we want to be able to evaluate, <coughs> excuse me, integrals in this case, and this leads to the theory of improper integrals. So in this section, well, we want to understand, hopefully we do now, why do we need improper integrals? Uh, it turns out there are different types, so we're going to classify a few different types. Uh, hopefully we can identify then when do we need to use this theory of improper integrals, and finally, we'll practice by evaluating some. All right, so let's get to it with the first type of improper integral. So the first type deals with definite integrals from a to t of f of x dx. And if these exist for every number t greater than or equal to a, then we can define the integral from a to infinity. So these are infinite type integrals uh, of f of x dx, which is this limit as t gets bigger and bigger, heads towards positive infinity, of the integral from a to t of f of x dx. Now, uh, this is, of course, provided that the limit exists uh, as a finite number. Alternatively, if the integral from t to b of f of x dx exists for every number t less than or equal to b, then we can define this integral from negative infinity to b of f of x dx. And this is the limit as t gets very small, heads towards negative infinity of this definite integral from t to b of f of x dx, of course, provided that this limit exists. Okay, these pro improper integrals uh, are called convergent. So convergent is the definition here. Uh, if the corresponding limit exists as a finite number, and divergent if the limit does not exist. If both these uh, integrals exist, a to infinity and negative infinity to a, then we can actually define uh, the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of f of x dx, just as you would ex expect. The integral from a to infinity of f of x dx plus the integral from negative infinity to a of f of x dx. And in this case, a can be any real number. Okay, so there are our definitions. Let's actually practice using it. Uh, so I want to evaluate this integral from 1 to infinity of the natural log of x over x squared dx. And so I need to think a little bit about, first of all, how do I even integrate the natural log of x over x squared dx. Forget about it being an improper integral for now. Just how do I evaluate this thing? So after staring at it for a little bit, hopefully you agree that uh, integration by parts could be used. So integration by parts where u is equal to the natural log of x, and therefore du would be 1 over x dx, and dv would be, well, the rest of it, which would be 1 over x squared dx. Uh, therefore, v would be negative 1 over x. So now if I plug these in, right, integration by parts says I need uv. So here's my v, there's my u, minus the integral of v du. So here's my v, and my du is 1 over x dx. And now this we can integrate. So I get my negative natural log of x over x, and then minus minus will be plus. And when I integrate 1 over x squared dx, uh, well, this will just give me the negative 1 over x. Okay, 
Now let's worry about being an improper integral. So the improper integral uh, from 1 to infinity of the natural log of x over x squared dx. Well, according to our definition here, we need a limit, right? So this is the limit as t approaches infinity of the definite integral from 1 to t of the natural log of x over x squared dx. Well, now we know how to evaluate out that integral, right? So that integral, according to our work above, is going to be this natural, sorry, the negative natural log of x over x minus 1 over x. And now we need to evaluate this from 1 to t. Okay, so when I plug in t into this thing, well, this would be, let's see, the negative natural log of t over t minus 1 over t. And then when I plug in 1 into this, well, let's see, when I plug in 1 into natural log, I get 0. And when I plug 1 here, well, this would be negative 1 over 1. Okay, now let's think about this limit here as t goes to infinity. Well, as t goes in to infinity, uh, well, the constant part won't do anything. So this is just going to head towards 1. And 1 over t is going to head towards 0. So the only interesting thing is, what about this negative natural log of t over t? What does this head towards? So let's pull aside really quick and think about this. Negative natural log of t over t as t goes to infinity. Well, this is going to something like infinity over infinity. Ah, so this is an indeterminate form of infinity over infinity, and therefore we can use L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule says take the derivative of the top, take the derivative of the bottom, and the limit should head towards the same thing. Oops, I forgot my limit. So this is the limit as t goes to infinity, that these should approach the same number, and well, this is going to approach 0. So therefore, we know then that this term right here goes towards 0. Okay, so therefore the limit is 0 minus 0 plus 1. So this goes towards 1. And therefore, by the definition, this integral converges, right? This limit exists as a finite number. So yes, the integral converges. And better yet, we can say what it converges to. It converges to 1. All right, so there is our first example. For the second one, uh, this is a theorem. So I want to prove that this uh, improper integral is convergent when p is greater than 1 and divergent when p is less than or equal to 1. So we can think about some different values, right? This will help us tell uh, if this improper integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx converges or not. What about 1 over x squared? Does this converge or not? What about uh, the integral of 1 over x to the negative fifth? Does this converge or not? Right? And we could make many more examples, right? So this is covering a lot of situations here. So let me delete this, and let's get to the proof. So the claim is we can prove this. This is a theorem. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, so let's break this up into a few cases. The first case should be if p is greater than 1. And the claim is, in that case, it actually does converge. So my case is that p is greater than 1. And I'd like to take a quick side note here. Uh, and mention that if I subtracted 1 from both sides, that would give us p minus 1 is greater than 0. This will come up here in just a minute. Okay, so now let's look at this improper integral. The improper integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p, where p is greater than 1, dx. So by the definition, this is the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x to the p, dx. Let me just write this as x to the negative p dx. OK, now let's go ahead and evaluate out this integral. So limit stays the same. When I integrate, remember I have to add 1 to the exponent and divide by that new exponent. So this is going to be x to the negative p plus 1 and divide by the new exponent, negative p plus 1. Because then if you took the derivative, we'd get back to where we started. OK, evaluate that from 1 to t. So this is going to be the limit as t approaches infinity. And now when I plug in t, well, nothing exciting happens, right? I'm substituting t in for x. So everywhere I see an x, I plug it t in. So that's t to the negative p plus 1, or I'll write 1 minus p. And then I have 1 minus p on the denominator, minus. And when I plugged in 1, well, 1 to any power here is going to be 1. So therefore, I just get minus 1 over 1 minus p. OK. Now, as t gets very large, well, let me go ahead and factor out. I'm going to do a little bit of work here. 
First of all, I see that uh, I have a 1 minus p in the denominator, so this is a nice common denominator. I could factor this out of my limit. And this 1 minus p is a negative number uh, because p minus 1 is positive. So in some sense, if I wanted this t to have a positive exponent, uh, you know, I would push it into the denominator, as we do. So this becomes 1 over t to the p minus 1. And now this is positive, right? And so as t gets very, very large, as t goes to infinity, and I have a positive exponent here, well, this is going to stay in the denominator, so it's going to be 1 over something very, very large. 1 over something very, very large is going to be essentially 0. So this is going to be, uh, here's my 1 over 1 minus p times 0 minus 1. All right, so another way we could write this is 1 over p minus 1. All right, so this shows that, yes, it converges. And better yet, we can figure out what it converges to. Right? It converges to 1 over p minus 1. All right, let me use the magic te technology here to shrink this down a little bit. I'm sorry for those of you who don't have this power, because um, now I need to break it up into two more cases. So I need a little bit more room. My second case is going to be something interesting happens uh, when we have p is equal to 1. And that's going to be, well, when we integrate 1 over x dx, we get the natural log. That's the special uh, power here. Uh, is, you know, all the other ones follow the power rule. But when you have just 1 over x, when you integrate that, we get the natural log. OK. So in this case, integrate 1 over x, I get the natural log of x. I need to evaluate that from 1 to t, and then let t go to infinity. So when I plug in t, well, I'll just get the natural log of t. And when I plug in 1, well, the natural log of 1 is 0. So as t gets very, very large, this heads towards infinity. Or if you'd like, uh, and of course, infinity minus 0 is infinity. So therefore, this diverges. It does not converge to a real number. It converges towards infinity, aka it diverges. OK, there is my second case. And my third case is going to be when p is strictly less than 1. And then I've considered all the cases. So when p is strictly less than 1, the claim is, well, this is going to be quite like the first case. So I'll do a quick note that in this case, 0 is actually less than 1 minus p. So this is saying 1 minus p is a positive number in this case. So let me go ahead and copy this part, and we'll see what changes. So the claim is these first two lines are actually good. So the first two lines are good, uh, but now we change it uh, when you have this t to the 1 minus p that this is already positive. Okay. Yep, greater than 0. That's greater than 0. So this is going to head towards infinity. Infinity minus some number still is infinity. Right? So as t gets very, very large, no matter what power you have here, this is going to be heading towards infinity. All right. So therefore, this entire limit approaches infinity, a.k.a. it diverges. So approaches infinity, diverges. And there we have it. Now I've considered all three cases. All right, and with that, let's go ahead and take a break. In the next video, we're going to move on to the second type of improper integrals. I'll see you shortly.